everybody, and welcome to the 30th anniversary of that slasher movie, Slaughterhouse. I'm Rick Rossler, I'm the writer-director of Slaughterhouse. And uh, it's been 30 years, and you can take a look at what 30 years does to a filmmaker by looking at this puss and the one that I'm showing you right now. One of the unique things about Slaughterhouse, I think, is that it's a horror picture with a plot. A lot of the horror pictures were slice and dice like ours is, but they didn't have a real good reason for slicing and dicing other than there were some beautiful kids and they, the opportunity arose. What we wanted to do, or I wanted to do with the screenplay that I wrote, was to have a pathetic character and also the plot that would unveil one of the most insidious civilized problems of, of society today, and that's taxes. I've paid my taxes for the last 30 years when I could. I bet I paid your salary a hundred times over, buddy boy. And this is what I get after 30 years. So this plot centers around the prosperous slaughtering plant owner and a conniving lawyer to take over the property of this poor, defunct slaughterhouse. This is me off making another proposition to this guy. Well, the one thing I learned in the legal profession, Tom, is you gotta take care of number one. Everybody else is number two. So let's just say I'm helping myself, you and old Les Bacon, by doing this. Therein lies the real issue. So uh, we tried to establish also a little bit of comedic action in the thing because my understanding of horror is it can only be related to human experience. And so something that's horrifying, you have to have something comedic in your life to balance it out and to understand true horror. So that's what we did. We had laced this thing with comedic dialogue and activity. Bacon whip him with an ugly stick. No, actually, Les has always been pretty good to the boy. A little lightheaded, though. He had a younger boy. Whatever happened to him? No one seems to know for sure. His mama died giving birth to him. Well, if he looked anything like Buddy, he's probably so ugly the hogs ate him. <laughs> <laughs> and also the character of Buddy. Uh, pathetic. He uh, doesn't speak. He's a grown person, very grown. And he just snorts like a hog, and that's his whole life. His pigs, his pigs are like your dogs to you. His pigs are his whole life. And you better not mess with his hogs. I was very fortunate to have a really good professional friend, Jerry Enko, who I teamed with on this project. And he was excited about it as I was, even though he wasn't a devotee of slasher movies. But uh, he and I have been working together for years, making training films and documentaries and promotional films, but we'd never really done a theatrical film. And you couldn't ask for a better partner, I tell you. He was very rock solid through this whole ordeal of producing this thing, and particularly in obtaining capital, which I think is the hardest thing to do. And then the second hardest is to wait for your money at the tail end from the distributors. It may never come. I wouldn't wait at the door, and I wouldn't wait for the Postal Service to deliver my check. Now's the time to shoot Slaughterhouse with the lightning and all. I'd like to talk about casting the actors. With any production, the acting has to be pretty darn good to, to satisfy distributors and to, to uh, convince your audience. We had nobody in mind for most of these characters. We didn't know enough actors. So what we did is we put out a casting call up in Hollywood and we rented a theater and on a particular t date and time people showed up, quite a few people. And so about an hour and a half into it, I'm going ho-hum, yeah, I've seen some good people for various cast members, but I haven't found Buddy and Buddy is the key to the whole thing. And we took a break and I was standing out on the corner getting some fresh air and all of a sudden, this person walked up to me, all 300 pounds of him, and he was in dungarees. He came dressed for the part. And he said, excuse me, sir, he said, is this the tryout for Slaughterhouse? And I looked at him and I went, whoa. I said, that is the Budster. The only problem was that the Budster was not this humongous thing that I envisioned, this character that could grab any six-footer and make mush out of him. No, no, Budster, was all of five foot eight or nine, that was it. So I was looking at the a diminutive, gigantic person, and I thought to myself, well, the magic of film. 
you know, he, he's Buddy. There's no doubt about it in my mind. Uh, but what are we going to do now with our other characters around him? Because they're all going to be taller than the Bud. So what we did is we make, made some decisions on the key personnel that played around Buddy that they would be at least his size, if not just slightly taller. And then we would elevate Buddy for the scenes. He'd walk up ramps. He'd walk on or stay on pallets while we were shooting. So he looked much bigger than he was. Uh, one of the other issues we ran into was Les Bacon, his dad. Uh, we needed someone fairly diminutive as well to play opposite him and to be able to walk through scenes. And so Don Barrett filled the bill. Not only did Don Barrett have the right height, but Don Barrett had the great face and he was a fine actor. He was really, really easy to work with. And he had that grizzled look and his hands looked like a man who would wield uh, craftsman knives like like this one for skinning the hide off of people and this one for boning. These knives, each one has its own purpose. Boning, carving, slicing. So Don Barrett as Les Bacon really filled the bill. The next problem was who's going to be the ingenue, the lead lady in this whole film. I wanted someone who personified strength who could take care of herself. I didn't want any little gal that would scream like a pig if he was attacked by a slasher. I wanted someone who would fight back. And Sherry Bendor filled that bill. I can tell you we looked at a lot of young ladies for that part. In fact, my wife and I spread eight by 10 glossies of actresses that we had seen up there at the theater and interviewed and I put my finger on Sherry Bendorf. I said, I think she's the right one for this. She has kind of an elegance about her that some of the other girls might not have had at the time. I think they were all beautiful. The ones we selected were tremendous actors. In fact, I, I kind of regret the fact we slashed and killed one of our favorite little actresses right at the very beginning of the film. We're all going, what do we do? You know, we got rid of a very fine actor. <laughs> So we filled the bill and our character, the sheriff and so forth, they were all just top guys and they were all there at the theater. 10 bucks. It says you won't last an hour out there. Yeah, alone. I want to talk a little bit about the locations. This was very key to the success of this production. Sure, the actors have to be good, the script has to be good, but definitely the locations have to fit the bill. And boy, were we lucky. Jerry and I were having a very tough time finding locations around San Diego for this. And I'm talking about the exterior for the slaughterhouse more than the interior. The exterior of the slaughterhouse had to be creepy. It had to be old. And Jerry just happened to hit upon it. Down near the Mexican border, on this side of the border, thank goodness, was this old produce plant. It was an old produce packing plant. It was not being utilized. We contacted the owner of the property. He said, oh, I'd love to have you guys shoot here. Not only did he have the packing plant look for the exterior, but he had one of the most derelict boneyards of equipment around. We hardly touched a thing. And the ace in the hole, it was that he had pig pens and he had live animals in those pig pens, a stone's throw from the old slaughtering plant. The other thing that was great, and we wrote this into the script, was there was a pond there and the pond had a pier that jutted out into it. And we just said, wow, I gotta get to work. We've got to figure out a whole new opening to this thing and I'll rewrite it because we have this great old bus. We have the great pond. We had tons of just stuff strewn around and we had to use it. It was just too much. So I went to work and uh, finally uh, came up with some ideas and Jerry helped me on that. And of course, long nights out there, cold nights in some regards, shooting that out in that boneyard out there. Well, that took care of our exteriors. But how about the interiors? The slaughtering plant, as you see it in the final film, is actually three different interiors. We went to two vacant slaughtering plants and one, I think it was a dog food. It was a dry dog food plant. And anytime you see them running up down stairs, wooden stairs or going through that maze of wooden rafters and things, that was in that dog plant. By combining those three locations, we were able to make one super plant, okay? And you'll hear the dialogue. Yeah, I wonder about those underground coolers. Whatever happened to those underground coolers? 
I don't know. I ain't, I ain't been down there in years. And that establishes the fact that we can have these grandiose, huge chambers down below, even though the slaughtering plant exterior looks a little bit small. When you see the opening of the live pigs being slaughtered, that was really difficult for us to find someone who would cooperate, who actually performed that task. And we were very, very fortunate that someone knew of Ted McKillop's farm up in Oregon. We had tried down here in Los Angeles to deal with uh, processors, larger processors of pigs and cattle. And to no avail, they didn't want us around. But Ted McKillop said, come on up, we'd love to have a Hollywood crew come in. And uh, we explained to him what we were doing. And we went up for two days with a Aeroflex 35 millimeter 2C and we shot all those scenes in the slaughtering plant. And the men who are the tradespeople in there carving up the pigs were more than helpful. They were tremendous. Every time I asked about something or wanted a certain angle, sure, they'll do it. And Ted and his wife are great hosts, so I sure thank them for that opening. And I'll tell you about the editing of that sequence in a little while. The town that we selected, we had to have a rural town. And east of San Diego is the town of Lakeside. And Lakeside is our hick town, so to speak, of San Diego. I know if any of them are watching, they would confirm that. They have rodeos, and uh, the kids wear cowboy hats, a lot of them. They love their pickup trucks. It's a great community out there. And the main drag that you see in the film and the old gas station and Oscar's restaurant are all in the town of Lakeside. So that's where we put it. And we shot it all in the town of Lakeside. You see the sheriff's fabulous home that was a home just off the main drag there, and it's a Victorian. We not only used it for the exterior, but we went inside to the kitchen and used it for the kitchen scene. And uh, it was very small, so uh, we had to block it carefully, and at one point the camera was actually out the back door shooting through the door frame to get a cover shot of that kitchen. We planned our initial shooting for six weeks. We had a enough money, I think, to get us through that. We had decided on definitely doing it in 35 millimeter. We needed to get very good DP, very good cameraman, and quality lighting guys, and we did. Luckily, one of my friends who I grew up with, kind of up in Glendale, California, he had become a cameraman in Hollywood, and of course, he knew a lot of people who, uh, through the years, would help him out when he came down here to do Slaughterhouse. And sure enough, we got not only Richard Benda in his first DP role, director of photography, but we got along with him, Owen Marsh, a top cameraman, and we got a host of really great assistant cameramen who gave their time to come down here and help Richard out and Owen. And we had great lighting guys. Ed Carr, a tremendous filmmaker. Jerry and I had worked with Ed Carr for many years, and he could do anything. He could edit, he could light, he could film. He's one of those tremendous filmmakers. We're lucky to have him. We also had Mike Scaglione. A key part of this film was all of the prop and all of the interior sets that had to be made. In other words, hanging the hooks in the right way and making sure everything works like functioning so we could use it in the old slaughtering plants, as well as the mummified remains that you see in the film. Uh, Mike went down to a pig ranch uh, in the South Bay near the Mexican border and asked the owner if he could rummage through a pile of mummified pig remains that was out back. And sure enough, he bagged a whole bunch of these carcasses and he brought them back. And, uh, and that's what you see hanging not only in the slaughterhouse, but outside of where uh, Les Bacon and his son Buddy live. So uh, Mike really played an important role in making it look great. We had a wonderful sound man, Joe Thompson. He was a consummate professional. He asked me, should I stop your recording when the helicopters fly over and things like that? Because the exterior of the slaughtering plant was near Ream Field, which is a Navy helicopter base. I said, absolutely, just tell us. I, we can't afford to do a lot of Foley in, the, in post. So he would let me, let me know when that happened. And uh, he, he got tremendous tracks, wonderful tracks. Now some of it we shot MOS and uh, you'll see some of that in the featurettes that accompany the DVD. Then there's Mike Lambert. Mike Lambert is one of those just great grips. 
and he's also a filmmaker. He not only had an Airy 2C, which we used in some of the pickup scenes, but he also had a fabulous crane, and it apparently was used by Alfred Hitchcock in one or two of his thrillers. But it was an old timer, it was on a, a flatbed truck, and we used the heck out of it, not only for dollying, but also for crane moves that you see throughout the film. And he was a wonderful jerry rigger. I came to him one day, I said, Mike, I want a spinning mirror. So when the kids try on their glasses, their sunglasses in the Rexall drugstore, I, I want them to spin that mirror and we're gonna dissolve to another scene. And he says, I can make it. There wasn't one in the uh, drugstore, but he said, I can make it. And sure enough, he delivered and it looked great. Then there's Joe Garrison. Joe Garrison is a musician and a sound enthusiast. He's a sound artist. He did all of our background music and he did a fabulous job. I would sit with him and Jerry would sit with him. We'd talk about the type of background music we envisioned. He would make notes and then he went to work on his Fostex. It was an inexpensive, relatively inexpensive Fostex multi-track. And he came up with some of the brilliant things that really enhance each sequence of the film. And finally, the volunteers, you know, the volunteers just poured in when they knew that uh, we were making a horror picture in that area. People just came in and said, hey, I'd be willing to pull cable. I'd be willing to help set up the lights. I'd be willing to lay the dolly track and so forth. And so many cold nights outside we spent and many of those people were volunteers. Some came in from the Navy and others are in civilian life. They heard about it. They knew uh, one or two people on our set and uh, they showed up. So did our investors, by the way. One of our deals with our investors was that you're welcome on the set anytime. You come in, you bring your family, uh, you get to see the big Panavision camera, the dollies, the crane, and how we block scenes. And, and it's a lesson in filmmaking, we, we hoped. And uh, most of them at the tail end of this whole affair, they came to us and they said, boy, we've never had more fun in our lives and we're ready to reinvest. And uh, Anyway, we were pretty burned out at that point in time. We didn't take them up on it, but we probably should have. We could have made some money maybe off this thing. One of the things that's really important to this whole thing in the last two reels is the rain. The rain and the storm that's coming in. Well, boy, did we luck out. One of the things that was there on the property and we were told we could use it was a pumper truck, a big pumper truck with a fire hose on it. And uh, the guys just poured water on the actors and on the set as we filmed. And of course they had to cover the camera with special covers and things like that. And that was very, very cold. And we had a 55 gallon drum with a fire going in. It. So all of us who got wet, including the actors, we could go over and warm up between the setups. But that was a, a big help in making great looking rain. Finally, when we got it all put together in a rough cut, we looked at it, Jerry and I did, and we thought, man, it's missing uh, a few things. You know, we, we need to set Buddy up a little bit better. And so we decided on a couple of little scenes that just showed the pathos of Buddy, that showed Buddy enjoying his pig. So we could have more depth to the character. Anyway, we went out back to the exterior, into the hog pens, and we took a 2C with us. And Buddy, he had been a Missouri farm boy, so he knew how to handle pigs, and, and it didn't mean anything to him to grab them, hug them, kiss him, whatever he had to do for the camera. And uh, the rest of us, we went into this big pig pen. Buddy plopped down where I told him to plop down without any cardboard underneath him. I told him, Buddy, there's a lot of urine in this straw and everything else. I said, we'll put something down, you sit on it, and it will be out of the camera range. He said, oh, no, no, I'm used to this. He plopped right on down <laughs> in all this smelly hay, and uh, we didn't. We put the camera on a box, and we put the box on big sheets of cardboard, and when we lay down, we were laying on cardboard. Well, we shot it with just some reflectors, and that was it. And the cat that you see in that scene was a wild cat that just roamed around the premises. And what we did is we grabbed him, and we held on to him, and we shot his scenes very quickly. 
And we also smeared, I think it was uh, some tuna fish. We had a, we went out and bought some tuna fish and smeared it on that fence. So he was interested while we set up. Another great scene that I always liked was Buddy and the dead bird. Now Mike Scaglione came up to me and says, oh, look what I found. I don't know if you can see it through here, but that is a mummified little bird. And he said, maybe you can use this in, in one of your sequences. And sure enough, that turned into Buddy trying to make a dead bird fly. Pretty pathetic if you ask me, but funny. I thought it was a funny shtick. Let's talk about the editing. We got to the editing phase, and first, what we did is we did cuts only. We had everything transferred over to video, and we did cuts only back and forth on video machines until we roughed in what we wanted. And then we got the work print on the flatbed editors that we'd rented from Hollywood and brought down to my garage, which I call Studio G for garage. And we set up a complete editing system in that garage. And Jerry and I went to town editing. In fact, when Jerry was home sleeping, some nights I'd wake up and I'd say, doggone, I gotta go out, I have inspiration. And I'd put on a, a scream reel where the girls are all screaming and things like that. And I'd work till one, two, or three in the morning. And all you hear is whoop, 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 scream, scream, whoop, 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 of the film going back and forth. And my neighbors to this day laugh about that because they heard it at two or three in the morning. But anyway, Studio G uh, was a fun place to be. And I can tell you, one of the things that uh, happened was after I cut the original slaughterhouse material for the plant up in Oregon, which is the real hog slaughtering plant, I asked Barbara, my wife, I said, honey, come on out. I want you to see what I've cut. And she took a look at it and went, no way. It's not gonna play in the theater. It's too gruesome. People don't wanna see this side of pork slaughtering or animal slaughtering. And so I had to scale it back, but I'm gonna show you a little bit of it. And we're talking about the thrusting of the dagger into the pig to bleed it. And when I was up there hand holding a 2C on the parapet that the uh, slaughtering guy was on, all of a sudden I got splashed with a stream of warm blood down the apron I was wearing. And luckily it didn't hit the camera. Anyway, we modified the opening. I think my wife was right. And uh, another thing that I really enjoyed doing was when you're shooting and you have 50 people standing around, actors or crew members or whatever, you certainly don't want to get into extreme close-ups. You can do those anywhere at any time with two or three people and the actor. So one of the things we did in Studio G, my garage, was we shot the extreme close-up of the knife being dragged across the fingertip by Bacon. All done in a tiny little frame right there. And guess who was Bacon in that one? My neighbor, I had a, an elderly neighbor. He said, sure, I'll come over and do it. And of course we had the same knife and all we had to have is a girl's finger. Well, we didn't have any girls that wanted to slit their fingers. So I used my finger. Now remember, I was 30 years ago, I was younger and had a younger finger. So we took a single edge blade and I drew it across there. Uh, and then we brought the knife across it in close up. And of course my neighbor was a real old guy and he had grizzly looking hands that matched Don Barrett's and we dragged it across and that's what you see. Now, and it took a, all of three people to do that instead of uh, consuming the time of a full crew. So that's one of the things if you're an aspiring filmmaker you might want to keep in mind. Once we got all our soundtracks uh, done, which I think we had a dozen soundtrack for the last reel during the storm with all the thunder and sound effects of the rain, etc. We took it all up to Cine Sound in Hollywood and we mixed for five days. And that was exciting to see it all come together. They did a fabulous job. Their engineers were really great and uh, had a great time up there. When you watch the credits, you're going to see who really edited this film. This flamboyant Sergio Uribe. Well, actually, Sergio Uribe is none other than Jerry Enko and Rick Rossler. And uh, I happened to be shooting a promotional for San Diego Gas and Electric, and this gentleman up from Mexicali signed in at the gate, Sergio Uribe. And I thought, man, what a name. You know, we have Laszlo Kovacs, we have all these, you know, East Block cameramen coming into Hollywood. And I thought, Sergio Uribe, I'm gonna use that someday. And we did.
Well, after it's all said and done and we were ready, we had some prints made for the theaters and we had our advertising in place. We went and took Buddy on tour. We went to Washington, D.C., where it was being released. We went to, let's see, Denver and Baltimore. I remember those being there. And uh, we had to hose down Buddy, because Buddy was a, a big guy, and he got pretty sweaty. So we carried Bright Guard with us all the time and hosed him down in the back of a pickup truck, where uh, we would cart him around, set him up with a big sign, and he'd sign autographs. Anyway, we had a great time doing that. Overall. I'd have to say that Slaughterhouse was really a lot of fun. Yeah, I spent evenings, what the heck am I doing when we're doing those 18 to 20 hour days and I get up in the morning and I look at the floor and go, oh my God, another 18 hours to go before I could even hit the sack. But right now, I tell you, I'd do it again in an instant. I, would, I wish we had turned it right around into Slaughterhouse 2. And even though Buddy apparently dies in Slaughterhouse 1, we could have brought his brother out, Maggot. You remember, it was Les Bacon and Sons, plural. So besides Buddy, there was a character in the back wing named Maggot. Anyway, we had a great time. The families were into it. Jerry's family was into it. Mine were on the set all the time, helping out. When we had the, the pig out with all the kids there, uh, my wife and Jerry's wife were right in there pitching me in, making sure everything was going well, and uh, couldn't ask for more. And even though I didn't have much of an income coming in at that point in time, my wife was working a full-time job taking care of our kids, and I, I owe a lot to her for being behind this 200%. And I'm sure Jerry feels the same way about Carol. Nowadays, I'd have to say that it's actually more economical to shoot. Even though you have higher salaries, uh, there are those expenses. But if you can get a lot of people who are willing to put time and energy in for practically no money, then electronic acquisition is the way to go. Film was so expensive, most expensive part of our budget overall. But now with an electronic acquisition and a good editing program, and 5.1 surround, I mean, there you go. You can literally do it at home in a bedroom, set yourself up and do what we had to do in laboratory after laboratory, and also up in the sound mixing houses and spend a lot of money doing it. So if you can garner enough money to get her rolling, do it. Go ahead, take a hit on it. Spare the bottle somewhere. Upstream, thank you, and ready. And action. Get your shoulder down. Keep going down. Good. 